I'm Megan McCarty Carino. Welcome back to Make Me Smart, where we make today make sense. It is Friday, July 7th. And I'm Rima Jerez, host of the Marketplace podcast. This is Uncomfortable. Kimberly is out today, and Kai is on assignment traveling in China with Treasury Secretary Yellen. So you've got two full in hosts. It'll be a good time. Uh, if you're listening to the pod, thank you for joining us. And if you're on the YouTube live stream for Economics on Tap, hello. Um, well, we've got, uh, you know, we've got the usual. We've got our drinks. We've got our yes, news. Yes, we do. Uh, we are ending with a little bit of a, a different game today, a kind of this is uncomfortable style game. So it'll be a good, yeah, I'm excited to do that. It'll be fun. But uh, first uh, up, let's let's talk about drinks, right? Let's do the drinks. Before I do the drinks, I'm hearing a bit of an echo. Do you hear that, Megan? Or is that just... Uh, you know I'm what? not hearing an echo. I wonder if you. Oh, uh, there we uh, go. If you're Sorry, y'all. This is first time technical difficulties. We'll <laughs> Worked it out. Difficulties. All we'll right. Now I think we're good. All right. Um, okay. So let's talk drinks. I have got what yeah. we call a date shake. Are you familiar with that? Ooh, lovely. Yes. Yeah, so it is a Palm Tell Spring date shake. Yeah. This is my first time making uh -huh. this. Um, it's been on my mental to-do list for a while. I used to live next to this smoothie shop in Los Angeles, and I once bought a date shake that was very overpriced, probably like $13, $14. And um, I've been committed to try to recreate it. So today was the day. Um, I found a recipe yeah. on Bon Appetit uh, and mm. made some adjustments to it. But basically, you toast walnuts, and then you soak some dates, and you combine it, and then you add some ice cream and cinnamon, and and that's pretty much it. Um and it's, mm, I would rate it like a, a six out of 10. <laughs> oh, it's, it's I very mean, sweet. Soaking in I would yeah. so. Yeah. I know there's like, well, there's a famous place in the desert, right? That does yeah. these date shakes that are like. Well, I didn't yeah. realize that when I was looking for recipes, I kept seeing these date shake recipes um, that connect back to Palm Springs. And so I looked into it and it's really fascinating. Apparently. Right. Palm Springs is responsible for 95% of the country's dates. Um, and it oh. goes back to like the early 1900s. Uh, the Department of Agriculture was like, yes, the Coachella Valley, which includes Palm Springs, is the perfect place to cultivate dates because um, it gets really, really hot there. You know, there's not a lot of humidity, makes it the ideal site to grow them. Um, and they imported them from North Africa and the Middle East, which, you know, I'm Middle Eastern which maybe explains my affinity for dates. <laughs> um, but I didn't realize that connection to Palm Springs. Who doesn't love dates? Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 good. I think I need to make some adjustments, though. I used um, Halo type ice cream instead of like the good oh, stuff. Oh, that's your problem. I, I know. Like I think it <laughs> muted some of the flavors. It's not it's not great. But I have some water to wash it down. <laughs> yeah. And I'll try it out again. What are you drinking? All right. So uh, I am drinking a, it's like a non-alcoholic um, spritzer. It's this brand. I've been trying out some yeah. like, non-alcoholic different drinks. It's this brand, Weekday Vibes, huh. Bitter Orange Spritz. Um, and it is, it's kind of a base of like de-alcoholized de wine with kind of like bitter orange flavor. Um, and of mm. course, got a little... Got to garnish it up, you know, just to, oh, looks just to zhuzh it a bit. Yeah. Wait, what um, are you using for the garnishes? Is that a grapefruit? Just, so I, uh, it's an orange. Oh, uh, okay. Nice. Just to go with the, the bitter orange theme. That makes um, sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I wish I had had like a, a blood orange or something that would be mm. more, um, you know, a little bit a little bit more special than a regular old orange, but it does the job. And, and I do tasty. have like a, a large ice cube. Um, how do you so, make yeah. those large ice cubes? You just have the I have a mold. It's a mine is not a silicone mold, but it's I think it's like a some sort of rubber mold that makes mm. the large the large <laughs> ice cubes. It just feels fancy. I love it. Are, it does. Yeah. yeah. It just feels yeah. more special. Um should All we right. check in with what, we... what folks are drinking at home? Oh yeah. Let's see. What are y'all drinking? Okay. Mm. Are you seeing any drinks? This is our first time. This is my first time using this live yeah, stream. Sorry. So I'm trying to wrap yeah, my head around like, it. Lemonade. There's a lot of windows. I know. I'm feeling kind of overwhelmed, but um, 
Nice. Nice. I don't love dates, the food, you know, dates are great, but they can be very overpowering. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just like mainlining some, some yeah. sweetness there. It's, yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, all right. Well, why don't we start talking about the news? Just get right to it. Yeah. Um, do you want to jump into the news? Yeah. Right. Well, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Sure. So, uh, I'm sort of continuing a theme that we have been on this week on, on make me smart, kind of looking at this new Twitter killer threads, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. from Meta, AKA V formerly known as Facebook. Um, So uh, according to some reporting from Semaphore, Twitter has sued Meta over its new app threads. Mm -hmm. Um, In a letter to Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg, which was seen by Semaphore, uh, a Twitter lawyer accused Meta of stealing trade secrets and intellectual property uh, in its creation of threads, in part by hiring dozens of former Twitter staff, which I think is an interesting point, given that there were yeah. a lot of unemployed Twitter staff around. That is uh, true. <laughs> after they did some mass layoffs, um, mm-hmm. Meta has, you know, called the accusations baseless. Said no one from Twitter worked on the app yeah you know who knows um but i think it is just sort of indicative of how this is kind of cutting a little close to the bone for for twitter this is the first really big competitor in a line of different you know competitors that have popped up including blue sky uh are are you on blue sky being led by i am on blue sky i have done like almost nothing with it i have to say i'm not I'm not a real like early adopter type and I think it gets mm. to why Threads appears to be so successful early on. You know, it got like 30 million downloads in the first oh, day, what? which exceeded even uh previous to that like ChatGPT had been the most quickly downloaded app in history. Um but this was even faster and I think that you know, the fact that it's from an already existing and very large social media platform um, sort of overcomes some of the lag in network effects that happen with all of these other, like Blue Sky, I'm like, okay, I'm not, you know, I don't know if I want to invest the time in like going and following everyone that I follow. Twitter, like I kind of dabbled in Mastodon for a little bit and was like the same thing. I kind of like, I want to, I want to wait till the dust settles a little bit Mm -hmm. before Mm -hmm. I figure out like what is really going to be the one that everyone goes to. And that's the trick with, with social media, you know, is it's like a platform can be bad in many, many ways can have all kinds of technical issues, you know, like privacy policies that we don't like. But if that's where everyone that you know is, then it's really hard to leave. And it creates a kind of anti-competitive landscape, you know, where it's just it's really hard to go to the mastodons, to the blue skies when you don't know you know, if that's where all your friends and all the people you follow and all the, you know, conversations that you want to be listening to are going to end up. Yeah, that's true. But I think that's why I don't you- like threads so far. I think there's a bit of, a little bit of a lag. Um, but no, I, it feels so I begrudgingly signed up last night. I was feeling some sign up fatigue. I was like, am I really going to do this? Should I hold off? And then just went ahead and did it. Um, and I spent a few minutes scrolling through it and it felt like I'd been transported into 2010 and like seeing these posts and comments from people mm-hmm. I went to high school with and from celebrities like Ellen DeGeneres. And I'm like, what, what am I doing here? What's going on? Uh, um, yeah. And I get yeah. what you're saying that it feels like there are a lot of people in one place, but I don't really love that I'm replicating my following list from Instagram. Like I'm fine seeing those people's mm-hmm. pictures and videos. Oh, totally. But I don't need to hear their inner thoughts or hot takes. Like I would rather have a more curated right. list of yeah, funny. Yeah, I follow and, a lot of like interesting people. Yeah, food and silly animal accounts that I don't 
necessarily need to know their microblogging thoughts on yeah that. yeah it feels like kind of um, like we've entered this party oh I think it's I was gonna say it feels like we've entered a party where like the guest list was just like yeah come on through and bring whoever you'd like and that can be fun sometimes yeah. it also could be incredibly hectic and overwhelming and I just makes me want to go into the corner and not talk to anyone <laughs> that's my initial feeling but who knows what'll happen to the to the platform mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually didn't finish signing up for Threads <laughs> because I started to, I, I started down the path, like I downloaded the app. I'm one of those 30 million that downloaded the app in the first day. And then I started reading all of these concerns about the privacy policy. So when I sort of got to that point of like, okay, sign our privacy policy, I was like, yeah. oh, I heard that this is not great. And so I looked into it a little bit and it is kind of not super great. Um, so it's not like one of the reasons probably the reason that uh, threads is not become available in the eu yet is because uh of these privacy issues um and privacy data privacy being more heavily regulated in the eu mm. under gdpr meta has had some judgments recently against it that sort of like put in question some of its you know regular data policies so i read that um, mm. you know, some of the hangups, some of the red flags for threads in the EU are that it collects sensitive information about mm. people's identity, um, their health, fitness, location, employment, like all of these very kind of sensitive things it collects and shares with third parties for advertising. Uh, which, you know, I think nobody should be surprised about at this point. Um, but these are sort of things that like in the EU, Facebook has made the case that, oh, it collects data about these things for some other purpose rather than just selling it to advertisers. And the EU courts basically just were like, uh, no, that's not true. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you don't have sort of like a business uh, like a sort of like operational interest in collecting this data. And so that's why it may be on hold in the EU. Uh, and you can't delete your account without deleting your okay. Instagram account, which is true. That's true. I saw that. And it was the one yeah, thing that was it is true. It is true. Making me hesitate last night whether or not I should download it. Um, yeah. That's not great. I don't like that. Uh, they have to get rid of it. Yeah, because I think a lot of people have different feelings about Instagram than many other social media like it's kind of the one social media platform that despite all of the concerns about the data that's collecting and you know presenting you with really clever and pretty good advertising that sometimes makes me buy stuff uh, I think people generally enjoy the experience on Instagram to an extent that they may not on Facebook yeah. and Twitter so yeah it's a tough one We'll see what happens. Um, um, I yeah, should plug, so I read this great article from the Atlantic last night. Um, and the central point was that Threads proves that social media is fated to repeat the cycle of life and death. That was the thesis of the article. Um, it's really, I thought it was a good read if you want to check that out. But anyway, let's move on. Yeah. So All speaking right. of the Atlantic, also saw another article this morning that I would love to talk about. This is a story that has been in the news cycle for a couple of weeks now, but I find it really fascinating. Um, it's a story that is just dripping with irony. So last month, Francesca Gino, she is a Harvard Business School professor who studies dishonesty. She was accused of falsifying data in at least four papers. And now there are some allegations that she made fake data in dozens of other published papers. Um, She's now on administrative leave and it's it's a wild story. And, you know, these accusations are significant because she is a leading scholar in the field. And, you know, behavioral science is not only interesting, at least to me, but it's important. Yeah. You can combine. Yeah. I mean, we've done stories on Marketplace uh, that relate to behavioral science. Or Constantly. Economics. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because it can combine elements of economics and psychology to understand why we behave the way we do. And that can ultimately have implications for government's public policy. So um, she's published a lot of things with a central question of why do normal people lie and cheat? And um, again, 
it's just uh, so much irony here. And so her research, for example, has tried to show how, I mean, it's tried to, tried to show a lot of things, but um, in particular, how rates of cheating go up in response to different social factors. So like, she has this one paper that shows that when people are just in the presence of abundant wealth, like if we're sitting at a table and there's hmm. seven dollars, seven dollars, seven thousand dollars worth of bills um, scattered all around, you're more likely to cheat when given a task. Um, and so the author of this Atlantic article uh, poses this question of like, what would Francesca's contested science say about Francesca? Like, was she in some way searching <laughs> for a theory of herself, perhaps subconsciously? Yes. Who knows? But the author makes the point that she was she was in the presence of abundant wealth. Uh, she taught classes at Harvard for business executives and had colleagues who made upwards of $2 million a year. Anyway, all of this is just very meta and layered. Um, but it makes me think of just how it might shift perceptions of behavioral science. Like, yeah. I said, like I said, a lot of the findings, they're applied to real world settings. This is something taught within business schools and applied within companies. And so... Um, yeah, it just makes me more skeptical of the incentives yeah. and norms within this industry. Um, and, you know, just the fact that Gina was just the celebrated, almost like celebrity like researcher. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people like that within like pop psychology and, um, they get high salaries, high speaker fees, lots of money from book deals. And not that this is an excuse, but I can just imagine there's a lot of pressure to perform, to, to release these really unique and creative results. Um, and I was reading about this. I just like sort of fell in a rabbit hole this morning and was reading about it in the Financial Times. And they made this point that uh, testing other people's result within the research world is like a very normal scientific practice. But in behavioral science, the initial results are not replicated before they're quickly recycled is how the article put it into like sensational headlines or pop psychology articles yeah. and self-help books. Um, yeah, I was thinking about that with, you know, the social sciences that, I mean, I, I find behavioral science and like social sciences to be fascinating in part, I think, because it is so difficult to pin down why do people behave the way they do? And, you know, to, to provide some insight into that, I think is really complex and, and sometimes unquantifiable. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a field that is trying to sort of, you know, quantify and, and, and put like science on something that is extremely complex. Why do humans think the way they think? Why do they behave the way they yeah. behave? And I do, I do agree that like, as a journalist, um, you know, I think sometimes we can, we're not always skeptical enough about some of the very sensational kinds of findings that you know the studies in in fields like that have i mean in general um yeah of, of looking you know more deeply like i just think of all of the kinds of social science truisms that have been debunked in recent decades like the bystander effect and the you mm. know Katie Genovese murder um the new york times um, you know, has has gone back in, in subsequent decades and said the original reporting on that was full of flaws and kind of the mm -hmm. psychological extrapolations of how how bystanders react to, you know, violence or whatever, um, that the, that was, you know, based on a completely flawed understanding of the event or broken windows theory and policing, you know, that's mm -hmm. been sort of studied so much and it really you know there's a, a lot of holes been poked in that theory but these things sort of trying to reduce our very complex world and complex human behavior and you know societal behavior to to these things is i think very um tempting and like very attractive for yeah. humans and i think we sometimes overlook <laughs> especially in those mm -hmm. kinds of, you know, kind of non-exact sciences. Uh, oh, totally. Um, oh, I could keep talking about this, but I, I'm looking at the time because, well, okay, you know, we'll just end there. Um, so I think, why don't we take a break? And uh, yeah. when we get back, we're going to do what, we're going to do a new segment, actually, from This is Uncomfortable, yeah. the show that I host that we like to call Defend Your Splurge. So uh 
yeah, we'll do that when we're back. Very excited about that. Okay, I think we are back. So we're going to try something different on the show. We're going to do what we call Defend Your Splurge. It is a fun little segment in the weekly newsletter we do for This Is Uncomfortable, uh, where we ask readers to tell us you know, how they're treating themselves these days and why. Um, and so we're going to take turns talking about what we've splurged on lately. The only rule is that you cannot judge. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Drew is going to join us too. Are you there, Drew? I'm here. Hi, Rima. Hey, Drew. Hey. Um, oh. <laughs> so we this couldn't whole, do uh, the game without Drew. Yeah, Fancy I know. We Drew. were talking about it uh, offline and wrote, no, we have to have Drew. <laughs> so before we start, um, you know, we want to hear about your splurges. So you can drop them in the chat and we'll check in on them at the end. Um all right, Megan, do you want to start off? What is something okay. that you bought recently? All right. Uh, this is something that everyone who knows me already knows about it because I kind of talk about it nonstop now, but I have become the proud owner of an uni pizza oven. Uh, oh. About a month and a half ago, I had been, this is something that I had been wanting, pining after for mm -hmm. quite some time. And I just like mentally I had been waiting okay if they ever go on sale I'm gonna I'm gonna do it I'm gonna buy the pizza oven uh on sale I think it was like $350 I got the smaller sized one the 12 inch uni pizza oven um but I am kind of known for buying a lot of kitchen gadgets mm. and technology that I don't <laughs> quite use all the time i have like a sous vide immersion circulator and the those are helpful and i know it's so easy to just accumulate that, like, those things use forever but we have been using the pizza oven and it yeah. is really fun it's super fun but now i have just gone absolutely down the rabbit <laughs> hole of like dough making uh you know when i was like i'm just gonna buy dough from like whole foods or trader joe's yeah. or a pizza place or something i'm not gonna like totally destroy my life by trying to you know figure out the intricacies of pizza dough but of course you know you buy the pizza oven you right have to, you have to you figure have out to how to make the dough to, you have to do it so now my entire life it just like circulates around <laughs> dough recipes, proofing times, cold ferments, different pre-ferments, like it's a whole thing. Um, I'm That's a great hobby. The, the pizza oven has brought us a lot of, I would say it has brought us a lot of like joy and family time and friend time. It's a good centerpiece yeah. for like, we brought it on vacations. We brought what? it to my parents' house. Yeah. So. Oh, that's, that's a great the purchase ones. then. I think whenever yeah, a purchase. I feel like it's totally splurge worthy. Oh, it's 100% splurge worthy. I also think whenever a purchase uh, promotes like a communal, uh, yeah. has a communal effect rather, that's a good purchase. You know, if it yeah. if it yeah. brings more connection in your life and that's what it sounds like. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. Um, All right. And that just sits in your, oh, well. um, okay. Go for it, Drew. I think you're next. All right. I'm up. So, the reason this thing is a splurge is that like normally I don't like spend a lot of money on clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, and this my splurge is actually a hundred dollar sweatshirt that I bought when I was in Mexico. Normally, if I was going to spend a mm. hundred dollars on a sweatshirt, this would be like a high quality piece of clothing <laughs> that I could be like, all right, I'm going to have this for many years. I really need a sweatshirt right now. But this one was. I was walking past an art gallery in Mexico yeah. City and I saw a painting and I was like, that's a cool painting. And the last night we were there, my girlfriend dragged me into that art gallery and was like, let's buy that sweatshirt with that painting. Yes. <laughs> Actually, yeah. So it... it's a it's a red, but it's just like a basic red sweatshirt with like a print of this weird painting on it. It's got these like four sort of ghostly ethereal figures on it and three of them are wearing very pointy hats um 
<laughs> and they're kind of like cradling the fourth one. I don't know. I think it's just kind of like that, really unique and it's my little Mexico souvenir. Yeah. I feel like that's a really fun way to sort of like buy into art that it's not just something mm. that's going to be inanimate on your wall that you're going to wear it. And every time you wear it, you're going to remember exactly. your trip to Mexico yeah. City. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Um, that's great. That's important. Okay. So I'm looking at the comments too. There are some good splurges in there. Fancy face lotion. Canadian ketchup chips. Always on board. Huh. Mm. I don't. That, that sounds like something you gotta order. Special. Order. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so something I bought recently uh, is something that had you told me a year or two ago that I bought this, I would have been very confused and perhaps alarmed. I bought a, an expensive sleeping pad for camping about embarrassed to say no mm. we're not judging about three hundred dollars so um yeah they're i think i have the same they're one expensive <sighs> well so some context ex, here ex, expad yeah well i think the company's called hest or something anyway but um it kind of has to do with uh, a big impulsive decision i made last year um i don't know if you know this megan i'm not in los angeles anymore or maybe you know that i yeah. did know that I'm in Portland, Oregon, and um, we, my husband and I made the decision to move here last November, um, again, very impulsively. We were working in a one-bedroom apartment where we had to coast up, constantly negotiate who was working where because we both work remotely and um, paying way too much money on, a, you know, on the apartment. And so we were kind of stumped in terms of where to move. Initially, we thought we were going to move to New York City to be closer to our families, but then that would put us in the same problem. Anyway, so we separately had a trip planned to Portland and uh, leading up to it, we planted the seed in our heads of what if we moved to Portland? And when we visited, we loved it and realized that it would help us cultivate our uh, aspirational affinity for nature, the natural world. Um, and so we are here for like a year or two. And, um, one of the things on the bucket list is like, yeah, to, to get out and do things we wouldn't ordinarily do, which is one of those again, is, is going out in nature and camping. So it was my first time camping last month. And I really wanted to make, yeah, I wanted to make sure that it was a good experience. I had a positive experience my first time. So it didn't deter me. And it was important that we bought good equipment. And so one of those things was the sleeping pad. That was my very long witted way of, of justifying the purchase. <laughs> There's no um, price that's... on a good night's sleep. Right. 100%. And yeah. we've already camped several times. Uh, I think, yeah, I think it was worthwhile. Um, and we slept like babies. So I am very happy with that purchase um well yeah. congratulations <laughs> Thanks. I, I, both of you all sound like you've camped before yes I am sort of the the you know unwitting companion to a very diehard <laughs> camper so yeah gotcha I'm into yeah. all of the camping luxuries I support any camping luxury <laughs> I will I will definitely camp I'm not like quite serious enough about it to have like all my own gear but if i have a friend who's like got the stove already and got like got something in mind i'm like 100 percent down let's do it yeah um looking at some of the comments someone said i bought a custom quilting table so my sewing machine needle space is level with the table so nice no more pulling of the fabric because it hangs over the machine base and much better seams love it um yeah i love these purchases that help uh you know that are relate to our hobbies and interests and again like connect us with others so that is that is lovely um all right unless there's another comment i, I think maybe we can wrap up this time because i have plenty of bad ones <laughs> i yeah oh for sure i just didn't choose to talk about those today um, <laughs> i haven't shared those <laughs> <laughs> all right i think um that's that's it that was defend your splurge we feature new splurges every week in the this right. is uncomfortable newsletter um you can submit yours and you can also sign up for the newsletter there are other stuff there recommendations from the team i also write about what's on my mind each week you can sign up for that at marketplace.org comfort 
And Kai and Kimberly will be back next week. If you have a question, a comment, or a suggestion, a topic you want to get smart on, please email us at makemesmart at marketplace.org or leave us a voicemail at 508 be smart Make Me Smart is produced by Courtney Bergseeker. Today's episode was engineered by Jake Cherry. Drew Jostad wrote the theme music for our Friday game and was a good sport for Defender Splurge. And our intern is Nilo- <laughs> Nilofer Shabandi. The team behind our Friday live stream is Emily McCune and Antoinette Brock. Marissa Cabrera is our senior producer. Bridget Bodnar is the director of podcasts, and Francesca Levy is the executive director of Digital On Demand. Nice. Speaking of bad purchases, I'm about to go to the Amazon store and return some.